Hey guys, Connor here from CameraStore.com, and I'm joined by Nuno, also from CameraStore.com. And today we're going to be covering some advice that we got uh, on Instagram for new photographers. And we put out a call saying, what would you advise new people to do to get into our little hobby? Uh, and we're just going to go over some things that you said, and some things that we agree with, some things we disagree with, and try to put together some advice of our own. Looking at everybody's advice, in, in my opinion, the first question that you should be asking yourself is, um, why do you want to get into film photography? What's your sort of intentions? Uh, do you like old cameras, the, the aesthetics of it? Do you like collecting? Do you like history? Or are you just looking to take really nice pictures with that, you know, film aesthetic? Yeah, I think all, all reasons are valid and let's go straight into it. We had a lot of people talking about sort of what camera you, could, you should start with. Uh, a manual camera or an automatic camera. Um, like manual cameras, people are were referencing tangible dials, they're talking about mechanical cameras, cameras that don't need batteries. Um, people encouraging newcomers to start in manual mode to sort of go all in, jump in the deep end, um, and sort of engage more with this sort of process of photography. Um, whereas people on the other side are encouraging, you know, using point and shoots, autofocus cameras, things like the Minolta Dynax, uh, compact cameras like, like this one here that are, you know, easy to use and really do everything for you. And again, I mean, I, I don't know if you have anything to say. I think that both no. sides have a great point. Yeah, I think we could uh, we'll pass some uh, opinions here. So on the other hand, starting with a manual camera is a good thing. You might learn about exposure, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, you might see the results of those attempts or yeah. or those uh, mistakes only a couple of weeks after and it's really hard to keep track what you did and what you did wrong so i think yeah these are opinions but i would maybe yeah. start with something with an at, at least a a light meter at least yeah at i definitely minimum. yes that's a, a bare minimum and I, I think that there's sort of a middle ground and I, I think that's where something like the Canon AE-1 program gets so popular. And I'm not, you know, recommending everybody get an AE-1 program, but there are many cameras like it that have some manual things mm -hmm. and some modes that help you. Like this has full program mode even, where the camera will pick a shutter speed and an aperture for you, and you're just focusing and setting ISO, uh, which is, I think, a great middle ground for, for some people. And for plenty of people, depending on your familiarity with photography, and your comfort level, an autofocus camera that does everything is a great place to start. Yeah, I think what we're chasing here is to get some nice results that you will will uh, make you do more. Yeah. Because nothing is more depressing than like you, you pick up fishing and you go to the fish and no fish comes out. Yeah, there's no fish. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe right. maybe start with at least a some some sort of automation in the camera. Yeah, yeah, a and I also think it's important to not put too much stress on the camera itself. Um, there's a lot of talk about the best camera and the camera that you need to take good photos. A lot of influencers online will say, you know, I use this camera and I took these photos, so you should use this camera too. Or this is the best deal in film photography. There are so many cameras out there and so many cameras that have very similar feature sets that um, what you can get your hand on uh, is really what you should be using, at least in the beginning, especially, um, to form your own tastes and then go in and pinpoint some models that you really like. Trying out different cameras, mm -hmm. shooting what you can find, at least in the beginning, especially. Um, and then there's there's just so many cameras out there. Moving on a bit to, to film and, you know, what you're loading in the camera, uh, we had people suggesting both ends of the spectrum, shooting with cheap consumer film, and people looking to shoot with the most expensive film, professional film. Um, on the cheap side, they're saying that if you're gonna mess up rolls in the beginning, which you will, in the beginning, the middle, forever, you're mm -hmm. gonna mess up rolls. I still mess up rolls. Um, so it hurts a bit less on the wallet and maybe on the ego as well to mess up a, a cheap roll of, you know, a lot of people said Fomapan, cheap black and white film. On the expensive side, yeah. you, people are saying you might not be satisfied with the image quality or the color profile of its color or the grain so yeah and I think at, at first it's really important to have some consistency so maybe not try 10 different films at first mm -hmm. you try a real high-end film which has like a really forgiveness yeah on the other hand we have like a lower-end film that is a bit picky on the 
on the exposure you you find that hey there's something to improve here mm -hmm. let's go that's a really other good than, point other than just balling out with the portrait 400 and <laughs> it's all portrait all day mm -hmm. if you're using different films and getting wildly different profiles uh, of grain and texture and color throughout your rolls so if you use the same film in the beginning you'll be able to tell so yeah, I also I want to bring up the point of maybe different films for different purposes. Exactly, and yeah, as we know, we have somewhat three main categories. So we have color negative, black and white negative, and then slide. Mm -hmm. I think we can already agree that the slide is is the high end yep. and most most trickiest to to master and get mm -hmm. great results due to the limited dynamic range. And then, I mean, black and white versus color is, is maybe more of a creative choice. I mm -hmm. think generally black and white films are a little bit cheaper, and there's more options out there for sure. But even in color negative, which is what I mainly shoot, um, there's consumer films and professional films. And, you know, I'll use consumer films for walking around, taking pictures of my friends, uh, at events, at places where it's more about capturing a moment rather than making art. Um, <laughs> and then switch to a professional film when I'm, you know, going out to do landscapes or something that maybe I'm taking a bit more seriously as photography. Mm -hmm. And getting back to the black and white, there's also, it might not be the, if you're just bringing out the lab, that's cool. But if you're diving in, yeah. developing your black and white, shooting me on meter camera, I mm -hmm. think you're going to have just a bad time to start with. So <laughs> then how do we find these cameras? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are many different ways that you can find film cameras. Uh, you can go on Facebook Marketplace, you can go on eBay, you can find them in secondhand stores buried under tons of different electronics and, and other stuff. Um, you can find them from stores like us that, um, you know, maybe they're in a little bit better condition. Um, you can find them all over the place. You can find them from relatives. That's a pretty common um, case is that, you know, you start getting into photography and, and one of your relatives is like, I have an old camera and gives it to you, which is pretty cool, honestly. Yeah, um, and it's really important to to know it works just a bit. Like you don't have yeah. to have a full report of the shutter speed. Just mm -hmm. if it does something, if it turns on, if it yeah. clicks, if it beeps, then it might be yeah. you know, in a working condition so you don't ruin a mm -hmm. roll of film by just trusting it that it will work because <laughs> you know just these are old items and even if you ruin a roll that's still learning something mm -hmm. um yeah it, it does sometimes take a few times getting burned with cameras that don't work for you to seek out something that's maybe a little bit more tested um but that's where stores like us come in we test things and that's one of our positives. <laughs> and one thing I would really add here is that most of the user manuals are available online. So I would really yeah. suggest you to take a look because yeah. even a basic SLR can be loaded different different way on, mm -hmm. uh, on different cameras. There's, mm -hmm. for example, the Hasselblad is way different than a, a Bronica. One thing that I wanted to mention is, is somebody who specifically said, don't buy cameras online. Um, and I, I think I see where this is coming from uh, because you can't hold the camera. You can't test the camera yourself. You can't see how clean it is. You know, people can easily fake photos and do all that stuff. I think it's more about finding good sources online and that takes some work, takes some research. Yeah, and this is not ruling out uh, a popular online auction place. Yeah. You can find a good deals and good working condition <laughs> items there. It's just don't let uh, one Apple ruined the whole basket it's true. sort of deal. It's true. An online auction site that we shall not name, but I named earlier. So <laughs> um, and then uh, one more thing is that paying a lot of money does not necessarily guarantee you good photos. Um, yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. I'm so sorry. Um, photography is art, so art is subjective. What constitutes a good photo is, is up to me or you or you. So spending thousands of euro or dollars or whatever doesn't guarantee you're going to get good photos. I mean, you can easily buy a Hasselblad and miss focus on every single shot. You know, if you see high prices, that does mean it's a desirable camera and that people want it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to make your pictures better. Yeah, anything else about that? No, I think we covered most. And should we go to the technical? Yeah, yeah, so we had a lot of people, you know, 
getting really technical, delving into some details, um, because you can do that. There's so much to uncover with mm -hmm. how these work and different things. Um, we had people suggest using uh, metering apps on your phone, which is something that I'm not super familiar with. I um, normally use an in-camera meter or a, a hot shoe mounted meter, but um, I haven't heard great things about these phone meter apps, if I can be honest, just about their accuracy, but they are far more accessible than anything else. So, For a light meter camera, you don't need a external, mm -hmm. let alone a phone app, which, yeah. you know, every, Phone is different, the camera sensor is different, so the light reading capabilities are different. Mm. But if you're already set your mind on a mechanical camera, maybe a real external light meter like the Dumo mm -hmm. or you know the handheld Seconic ones are yeah. the way to go there. Yeah. But if you're on a, you know, you can find a, this might be your first camera and you find it at the thrift store and then the light meter is, light yeah. meter app is your only choice then it's the right choice there. Yeah, yeah, especially right at the beginning, you know, you're not looking to invest hundreds just to find out you don't really like photography, which is totally fair. Um, then a light meter is in, on your phone is a great choice. I wanted to talk about the exposure triangle as well. There was a lot of people mentioning this, and I'll be totally frank with you, I didn't know what this was until six months ago, a year ago. I mean, I know what all the concepts are, but I've never heard it expressed as the exposure triangle. And Nuno's, yeah, this is, the fa you, this is the face he's giving me now, and he knew about this. Imagine when I first told him. Uh, so I don't, I'll let you explain it. <laughs> no, I think you have no, researched no. it. Uh, no, I, I haven't. Please, do you please explain it. <laughs> so basically, without showing any bad signs here on the uh -huh. TV, but here's a triangle <laughs> that has in each of the points we have. Here, I can hold up the triangle okay, so okay, you can okay, do the okay. points. So, <laughs> so here we have, let's say we have uh, the shutter speed. Mm -hmm. We get the ISO speed and the aperture. One change here will change here, change yeah. here, the change here. Yeah, they all affect each other. And that's how you come up with proper exposure. Yeah, so basically a <laughs> one stop is a doubles the light amount of light and mm -hmm. it needs you to change your shutter speed accordingly mm -hmm. or if you're well, film is quite lo uh, the film speed is quite locked here on yeah. the film camera, so then we can, when this is locked, so we can only yeah. change these two and we don't have to worry about this guy here. So we can yeah. only change the shutter speed here mm -hmm. and to mate it with the aperture. Yeah, and I think that might be why I haven't heard of it so much is because I don't shoot so much digital. Mm. So the ISO is really a, a fixed value for me because the ISO is the speed of the film. You'll see it on the box of film. This is uh, 125 ISO. There's no big number on this one, never mind. It's 125 ISO film, so you set the camera to 125 and then you leave it like that for the whole roll, um, at least in the beginning. You know, you can play with it later. So that's sort of a constant, and then you play with shutter speed and aperture to make it, the exposure work. Mm -hmm. So that sort of segues into the next point that um, somebody made, which is that uh, your, your camera's light meter, or whatever light meter you're using, uh, is sort of the law and isn't really up for interpretation, um, which I, I again I don't really I sort of understand where this is coming from and maybe it's good advice for a very new person, mm -hmm. but um, to phrase it so absolutely I think is a little bit naive. Um, there there are rules and the light meter will tell you how to expose your film properly, but. Um, it is a rule that you learn so that you can break it, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I have a quite disagreement here because, you know, most light meters are average. It meters the average of the whole scene, which in a way doesn't tell you anything because <laughs> there are shadows, mm -hmm. there are highlight details. You're a big spot meter guy. Yes. <laughs> but other than that, the, the camera's own light meter just average the scene yeah. or it has a center weighted Mm -hmm. But if you if you know what you're like in the beginning, maybe if you're a color shooter, just point it to the shadow, yeah, and look what it says there, and then point at the scene, and say there's two stop difference. Yeah, maybe it's wiser to uh, expose to the shadow detail there to get them exposed nicely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the light meter tells you 
more or less what to aim for, but there's creative control that comes out as you start to learn the concepts that we just talked about with the exposure triangle and with how your camera works. So, Yeah, but maybe for your first roll, just read the, what the meter will tell yeah. you. If you start jumping ahead of your abilities, yeah. you're going to have a bad time. Yeah, there's always time to learn. Um, <laughs> another hot take that I wanted to talk about was um, <laughs> somebody said that uh, if you shoot digital, that jumping to medium format isn't um, out, outside the realm of possibility. Like that's something that you can easily do. Medium format, anybody can jump to medium format. You can e learn manual photography on a Hasselblad if you want to. Um, I wouldn't recommend it because these are much less user friendly than uh, Canon A1, but you could do it. On the other hand, you might be a digital photographer who knows what exposure are, yeah. what aperture is, what does, what is the shutter speed does to the frame. In the end, this is just a camera as anything yeah. else. It yeah. takes photos, it, aperture is the same, yeah. ISO is the same, shutter speed is the same. But I get you what you're saying here, mm. that it might not be the feasible if you're just a, you know, hobbyist yeah. DSL shooter maybe. <laughs> Maybe this is not the next step. Yeah. Maybe it's just just some some film experience is is needed first. And if you do shoot digital, though, one thing you can do is try to find a camera that uses the same lenses. Mm -hmm. So if you're shooting Nikon or Canon DSLRs, uh, you can get Nikon and Canon SLRs, autofocus cameras that use the exact same lenses, and will handle just like your DSLRs. Um, they're great options, you know, if you have a, if you are a photographer, if someone in your family is a photographer and you don't, you can borrow the lenses back and forth, that saves money, it saves time, it just makes things really easy to switch back and forth and then you have a film body, you have a digital body. Yeah, just make sure they're compatible with each yeah. other. Some uh, EOS bodies are not compatible with the, with the lenses, yeah. you need a firmware update. But other than that, just in general, if you already have a system, just go with it. No need to yeah. get a Petri Color 35. Wow. Specific shade at Petri. So yeah, that, that just about covers the technical stuff we got. And um, now it's more, I guess, uh, emotional encouragement. Because um, getting into a new hobby, especially something that's expensive or intimidating the way that old cameras can be, um, it's intimidating, like I just said. Of course. Uh, it can be hard. So um, I think it's important to remember that, that it is supposed to be fun and it is supposed to be art. So there's no you know, telling if you did it right or you did it wrong. Every like second you spend playing with the camera is a second you're spending learning about photography, art, the camera itself, uh, and yourself even. You know, I think it's important to remember that you're not wasting film if you underexpose a roll or if you open the back at the wrong time and not get discouraged because dropping a hobby over you know a small mistake is something we don't like to see yeah i think the one ruined film is just one of a thousand rolls that you're going to shoot mm -hmm. you have shot at least a thousand rolls within wow. the last five five years whatever maybe so <laughs> don't be afraid try to look into what happened yeah it might be hard to <laughs> investigate what happened Let's say a blank roll usually means the shutter didn't fire or you loaded incorrectly. Yeah. Usually the second. Mm -hmm. If the exposure are bad, maybe you had to set the ISO dial the wrong spot. Mm -hmm. Maybe the light meter doesn't. Yeah. Just try to see what's going on and then try to diagnose it. Diagnose and build on top of that to yeah. avoid next mistakes. Yeah, and feel free to reach out to you know trusted names in photography, like like reach out to us via email or Instagram. We're happy to help. You can leave a comment on this video. Uh, we're happy to help with any issue you might have with your camera. You know, as with any hobby, it takes time to get good at it. It takes time to, to learn. Um, but give yourself that time and be patient with yourself, and you'll figure it out. You'll figure out how you want to interact with film photography, and you'll have fun doing it. So. Yeah, yeah, don't make this into a chore, make it an enjoyable hobby that you like to do, you want to do, mm -hmm. not like a, a must or something that is you have to study and be really spe specific. Just try, 
do something, change the dial, <laughs> overexpose, underexpose, see what comes out. Yeah. Well, that just about covers everything we got from you guys. So if you want to participate, we'll probably have more polls and more videos. So follow us on Instagram for that. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I've been Connor, here with Nuno, and we'll see you in the next one.